So my name's Melissa Broadway and I am currently the EASA Animal Welfare Coordinator. So um, welcome again um, to our first webinar. So we have Sally joining us today. Now we're very lucky to have Sally with us because she is the Director of Wildlife Conservation and Science at Zoos Victoria. Um, so they manage three facilities in Southeast Australia. Um, and she has worked on numerous projects in animal welfare. She has a doctorate in animal welfare science. She's previously worked on a number of different welfare assessments and she's going to be talking to us today about the welfare assessment tool that they have developed and implemented at Zoos Victoria. So I'm on behalf of everyone here today, um, I wanna to say thank you so much to Sally for joining us and we look forward to hearing all of your expertise on this topic. Um, it's very exciting stuff. So I'm just gonna hand it straight over to Sally um, and you could probably do a little bit more of an introduction as well. Thank you, Melissa. And hi everyone, thanks for joining. It's um, not as nice as seeing you all in person over in Europe, but i um, glad we could still have this chat and get together. Um, it's this evening in, um, Australia in Melbourne here um, but I hope you're all at least you know starting your day right with a good cup of coffee or something but um, hopefully this all goes to plan I think um, I'll just attempt a screen share now because I was going to start off with a bit of um, a bit of a background on Zoos Victoria and where where we uh, some of the context in which we operate hopefully that's working fine for you guys um yeah all fine for us and perfect and the um hopefully the sound's working all right too but we'll see as we get through so there's a, yeah, a few videos coming up in this but um so let me all right so a bit of an outline i thought to uh to talk about what we're going to cover in this session. Um, I'll start with an intro to Zoos Victoria. As Melissa said, uh, Zoos Victoria is the organisation that runs the three zoos here in Victoria in um, the southern part of Australia. So that's Melbourne Zoo, Werribee Zoo and Hillsville Sanctuary. And, um, and I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, a summary of what our focus areas are. Then we'll move into a bit of a discussion around the importance of having animal welfare as an institutional priority for zoos and aquariums and um, other animal care industries. Then we'll talk a bit about some welfare assessments and how it's really important to have a solid welfare assessment process as a foundation for zoo animal welfare progress. And then I'll move into a bit more detail around um, the risk assessment tool that we developed and have been refining over the past five or so years. And then that's the first part of this session. We'll have time for a few questions there. And then as Melissa said, um, the second part, I will discuss a little bit of the um, bits and pieces that are what we're calling positive spin-offs from the use of, of this tool because this is the stuff that we don't, you know, publish in scientific journals. It's, it's, it's the stuff that we notice and we like to talk about and we think is a really critical part of the value of these kind of tools. So we're going to spend a bit of time talking through um, how, you know, what the broader benefits of using such a process can be. So hopefully that sounds all right to you all. Um, just to kick us off, Rather than me um, talking through, this is a short video that um, gives a nice summary of some of the work we focus on and what our moral purpose as an organisation is. We often get asked what a zoo does in the 21st century. In fact, we think the word zoo doesn't fully explain what we're doing. So let's share with you what that is. We run breeding and recovery programs for many local species on the brink of extinction. We treat injured wildlife in our wildlife hospitals and send vets to run the triage centres in bushfire zones. 
harm to any marine animal needing our help. We teach millions of visitors to care for the natural world and make wildlife friendly choices. a wildlife conservation organisation. And for some species, we are their last hope. We won't let Victoria's wildlife go extinct on our watch. that gives you a bit of background of what what we focus on and and our our um, main area of interest in the local Victorian species so the conservation of of what wildlife is in our own backyard and we do have significant conservation challenges here in Victoria and so we we operate under a bit of a, a model that I've described here in this slide so the three key focus areas of um, of modern zoos and some of our key work focuses in these areas as well but it's very similar to a one health model that we that we see especially around you know human health wildlife health and environment health and so we've applied this to zoo settings because it's extremely relevant for zoos and how we operate as well so in the context of the zoo, these three key areas, the conservation, animal welfare, and human well-being or visitor experience are all incredibly linked and influence each other. Then you've got three areas of science that influence and help us understand how we can do better in each of these areas and these, these focus areas of modern zoos. So animal welfare science or wildlife welfare science um, more broadly is what we refer to as understanding, you know, what, what's going on inside animals. So how are the animals in our zoos faring, but also making sure that we consider wildlife of welfare, uh, sorry, the welfare of wildlife that we work with as equally as important as the animals in our care. And then conservation and environment well-being is, you know, our ultimate, our ultimate goal for, for modern zoos to achieve biodiversity gain in the wild. And then delivering this through human health and well-being and experience in the zoo as well. And that's where a lot of the social science comes in. And we run behaviour change campaigns to help try and influence more wildlife-friendly behaviours in, in visitors that come through the door. So all of these areas are so linked and interrelated to each other and influence one another. And the sciences behind a lot of them are so important for us to understand. And so I'll talk a little bit more about some of these sciences and, and specific areas of research that are underway in, in each of these areas as we go through today. But the first key point I wanted to highlight was that our understanding and, and the science behind animal welfare, if we focus in on animal welfare for now, it's, it's undergoing exponential growth. So this is, a, this is a great figure by Jeremy Marchant Ford in a 2015 publication and the, the trend would be even more um, even more extreme now if you if you have it up until 2020. The number of publications and citations of, of journals, journal articles referencing animal welfare and animal emotions, and you can see a huge growth. And this means that we've got a, a significantly enhanced understanding of these sciences of what animals are experiencing. And so you couple this growth in our understanding with the fact that information can now be rapidly disseminating around the, disseminated around the world through platforms like social media. This makes animal rights and welfare mainstream points of discussion for us. And this is very relevant for zoos to understand. And, and we've all noticed, you know, recent increases in some of these discussions um, at the moment around the role of, of organisations that look after animals in society. So I could talk about, you know, usually at this point, I'll talk about amazing examples of animals problem solving. And, you know, there's no shortage of videos of chimps, you know, making tools or even parrots making, making tools to seek out, um, you know, hidden nuts and things like that. There's an incredible array of videos that showcase how intelligent animals are. But I wanted to draw on some recent examples that we observed in 
our bushfire season just this past summer. We've seen some incredible examples of animals showing huge resilience, problem solving and learning and putting their survival skills into action. And I think this is a really nice way to think about or conceptualize animal intelligence or you know, emotional capacity. And I'll, I'll just draw in a few examples that we noticed. So this is, this is an image of a group of male lyrebirds standing around a dam. Now these guys are really territorial normally. They would tear each other to pieces if they crossed over into the territories. But you can see here, they've all obviously learnt where the closest dam is and water source and are tolerating each other just for this survival during this period. So as soon as the smoke came in and the bushfire started sweeping through, they learnt where the nearest water body was and have gathered around it. So incredible stories of, of wildlife like this, just engaging in these behaviours. Now this one is about, um, this is a, a corroboree frog, so a, a native species of frog up here, and these guys were really hard hit by our recent bushfires. And this is what their home looks like up the mountains at Mount Kosciuszko in New South Wales. So what we do for these guys is run captive breeding programs and then introduce their eggs into what we call ex situ in, in situ enclosures, which are disease free for these animals. And so our researchers, a few days after the fire had passed through the Kosciuszko region, went up to just see what the damage was done. And this is what they saw. So pretty, um, pretty grim outlook when they first got there and were looking around. And you can see the facilities there are completely melted after the fire swept through there. And that in the background there is where the frogs, frogs are released into these disease-free enclosures. But this is a video of one of the researchers seeing, look, this is, this is what it looks like from within the disease-free enclosures where the frogs that we release um, live throughout, throughout the year. And what you'll hear is the researcher doing a frog call and that's how they survey if any frogs call back and they can assess what it's like. So it's a, it's a very sketchy, blurry video, but you can listen out really carefully and you might hear something. Hey. Hey. So you can see their habitat and these these enclosures that they were in in the wild were completely decimated and, and impacted by the fires. But these little guys managed to survive it. We had over 75% survival from the animals in these spaces because they they smelt the smoke coming and hit the ground and buried under. And so they started emerging once the danger had passed. And another incredible story of, of the resilience and, and the ability of these animals to to live in these environments. Now there's other stories that have been doing the rounds here about animal survival and learning and cognition and emotions. One of my favourites uh, that we heard about these recent bushfires was, um, in fact, they pop up a lot of bushfire, um, bushfire seasons with warm bats. And the, there was a lot of discussion out there about these heroic warm bats out and about herding animals into their burrows and, and rescuing them effectively. And this is one we had a chuckle at because wombats definitely would not be out there herding animals and, and rescuing them through, you know, herding them into their burrows. But they indirectly have saved a lot of animals because wombat burrows are a common refuge site for animals escaping the fires. They do tunnel in. But the key point is only if there's not a wombat present because wombats are actually extremely vicious and, and very um, aggressive to any animals that come anywhere near their burrows. So we all had a good chuckle at that, but it's still another, another great example of, of animal survival instincts learning and learning ability. But the thing that struck us with this, uh, this current period was how much community concern there was for the plight of wildlife in these fires. And I'm assuming you guys in Europe would have seen some of it in the media as well, but it was all over our news here. And we had 
outpouring of support from people from all over the world, which was just incredible that they were, they were standing there with us and raising money for us to help uh, get the animals through this. And so that, that community concern for the plight of animals just warmed everyone's hearts and, and, and helped us you know, get through this and, and keep moving for the wildlife. And it's gonna be a long recovery process, but it, it highlighted to us again, how important animals are in society. And another example of this happening at the moment is um, some law reforms underway in Australia. So our, you know, the public pressure around concern for animals in society has resulted in a lot of the governments trying to update laws and regulations around how we consider animals. So our, our, I know a few countries in Europe have already done this, but our, our laws will soon be updated to recognise animal sentience, which, um, which is going to have really significant implications for a lot of animal industries. But we're all quite excited by what this will mean for enhancing welfare standards for uh, across Australia. And then this concern for animals and wildlife can also extend more broadly to the environment. And there's really interesting research and, and stats that have been um, investigated from different groups on how ethical consumption is on the rise. And so this, this figure shows here uh, an increase in the proportion, it, it, don't be too concerned about the different coloured blocks and what they all mean. Overall, they're all different categories of, of what's called ethical food or ethical consumption of, of materials. And you can see again a, a similar graph to the, the, um, the research graph that shows an increase in, in the purchase and the concern for these, these products and the plight of wildlife. And here in Melbourne, we see it. Um, and live it and breathe it. Melbourne is the, um, the apparently the vegan capital of the world and there's vegan tours around Melbourne. One of our big ice creams um, brands here, Magnums, now have vegan, um, vegan Magnums, which is exciting. And um, it's, a, it's a really strong community movement here. And I'm sure there's, there's patches of this all over the world as well, but it's an interesting trend to start to follow. So what does all this mean for zoos? We, we are an industry and society that house animals and, and have animals in our care. And this, this has gone, this is under increasing scrutiny at the moment with, uh, the, with the general community, but in particular in certain areas around the world as well. And we see a bit of it here in Australia, but I think a lot of the, a lot of the pressure does exist in other parts, but it's, it's only increasing everywhere, everywhere you look. And these are common, um, common kind of posters or, um, or messages that activist groups are suggesting around zoos putting the con in conservation. And that's something that's really important for us to be mindful of. There's a lot of campaigns at the moment, um, one that we'll talk a bit more about later from the World Animal Protection um, about animal selfies. That's, that's strong here in Australia, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's over overseas as well but it's a um, really powerful campaign asking for tourists to be much more mindful of, of their behavior when they're traveling and engaging in wildlife experiences and this group also actually lobbied instagram to get a pop-up um, when people try and hashtag animal selfies of certain uh, certain species this is a quokka here which people travel to rottnest island um, to try and get this famed quokka selfie and so they lobbied Instagram and when you hashtag quokka selfie, you get a pop-up warning that animal cruelty may have been involved. And so really, really mainstream changes that we're starting to see, you know, prompt the general community around what's going on here. So really important for zoos to be mindful of. And there has been a lot of recent movement in the tourism industry. Uh, and this is again, escalating in a similar trend to our knowledge on welfare science. And so we've seen a lot of big announcements um, from big travel companies that have you know, introduced new policies on animal welfare or human animal interactions around what products they sell, they sell. So very important for zoos to be mindful of them too, because we fit into the category of wildlife tourists or animal-based tourism. This research was really interesting by Tom Morehouse, who did uh, an experiment uh, where half of the half of the people surveyed were exposed to just the control, which is those two figures on the left here, um, without any information on welfare or conservation, just a summary of the experience. 
and people just showed a preference according to what you know what appealed to them. Then another group were shown images and asked to select which they would like to go to. And they were primed with information on the rating score and the conservation impact score. And the findings from this were extremely interesting. They found that when primed to, to choose an experience that had a poor welfare rating and, a, and an implication for conservation, they were significantly less likely to want to attend that. And so this tells us that this, this can be used as an opportunity. If we get our ethics right and, and offer ethical animal experiences that are backed in science, we can actually use that as part of our, our strategy to be an, you know, an ethical organisation with responsible tourism practices. So this means we need to think about how we showcase care and compassion because a lot of the good zoos and, and especially IASA member zoos will, be, will have care and compassion front of mind. We need to be transparent in our welfare practices and policies. But backing up all of this, we need to have a really solid evidence base. And so that's what we're gonna start talking more about as we go through this in, in terms of welfare assessment. So to hone in a bit more on this evidence base and what we can do more of in this area, welfare assessment is really the starting point for how to build up an evidence base because you don't want to be in a situation where you're talking about how important welfare is and, and how happy and, and well the animals in your care are without being able to back that up with substantial science and facts because the public are very clued on to this. They, we have access to information, you know, the touch of finger, your fingertips. So really important for us to take it seriously and, and have a solid evidence base behind what we, what we talk about. So some key considerations for this is to focus in on a continuous improvement philosophy. So this means this is so important in welfare, probably more than a lot of other industries, because re remember that graph of the publications we're continuously learning more and more about these animals. So things we didn't know even 12 months ago, we now know, and that has resulted in a change in how we should you know, run husbandry programs. So this is what we mean by continuous improvement. You wanna always be striving for better. You, you don't wanna to get to a point where you're happy with what you're at. You wanna focus on what else can you do. And that's a really important way of thinking for zoos. We also need to be mindful that we need to consider the full scale of welfare for animals. So this is from negative to neutral to positive. And so not just stop at a point where we're comfortable that you know, they're not suffering or we're preventing cruelty. We need to be moving into that positive animal welfare space. So really recognize the scalability of an animal's welfare. And adaptability is linked to continuous improvement. Being adaptable and able to, to incorporate new learnings and knowledge into what we do in our practices. And then I put bravery in there because that's the number one question I get when we, when we talk about our welfare assessment tools. It's what if, what if you find something that you don't want to, you know, that shows, you know, welfare issues or, or a challenge around welfare. And at the end of the day, you've got to be brave and you've got to know that you are going to find some things that are con quite confronting to, to, to hear and to see. But at the end of the day, knowledge is power and you need to be able to understand what's going on to be able to improve things and strive for better. So that's what the bravery part means. You need to be able to be um, ready to, to make changes and ready to be exposed to everything that, that, that some of the science can start to reveal. So digging a bit deeper into some of the science of welfare assessment, it really is a scale of um, that's, that's associated with a lot of trade-offs as well in what approach you want to take. So if we think of it as a pyramid, the most detailed, intensive and resource intensive way of welfare assessment is to look at the individual animal. And this, this is because welfare is an individual experience. And so to do this, you need to really focus on um, some detailed studies, experimental work on individuals, and you usually take a range of different um, measures or indicators, both behavioural and physiological, and, and make assessments or inferences about an individual's welfare from that. That requires very specialist skills, knowledge and resources, and often takes a lot of time and, and effort to do as well. So they're really important to do as part of your overall welfare program, and similar to a group of animals. But 
because it takes a lot of time, you need to really prioritize where you, where you need to direct that attention into the individual animal. And you can do that by focusing in on these high levels of assessment. So these are the institutional levels. So that's across a zoo. Look at the whole range of animals that live within a zoo and conduct assessments at that level. Or in the industry, that could be across IASA. So across different IASA zoos, that's what industry benchmarking is. And look at welfare standards across that whole range. And here in Australia, the ZAA, um, which is the Australian, New Zealand and Pacific Island Zoo Association, they have a welfare benchmarking tool as part of our accreditation process, which is really effective and really and, and backed in the five domains model as well. And so these higher level assessments, it is a trade-off in terms of accuracy and the level, the level of um, subjectivity that's involved. But ultimately, these kind of assessments are a series of metrics that are informed by science that allow rapid assessments to be made um, at, a, at a frequency appropriate to what you're trying to achieve. But both types of assessments really do feed into each other. You need the detailed science and understanding of individual animals and how their welfare is impacted to inform what metrics are sensible for you to be scanning across the whole zoo to understand. So I'm gonna to talk to you guys about a model that we developed um, that's targeted at this institutional level. So it's, um, it's what we call the Zoos Victoria um, risk, Animal Welfare Risk Assessment Tool. And so some criteria for this level of assessment, use science-based indicators. So things that you know are important to animals to assess incorporate both input and output measures. So input are measures that are associated with what, what the animal has access to. So environmental conditions and diet and, and resources that you're delivering to the animal. Then output measures are an assessment of how the animal is using those resources. So they're usually, they're also called animal-based measures. So it's usually a judgment on how the animals are using the resources that are being offered to them because if you just focus on environment resources that doesn't give you an indication of if they're actually meaningful to the animal so a combination of both is is a good is a good way to get through some of the challenges associated with these welfare assessments you also need to include um, scales or scores ranging again from that full um, full suite of welfare possibilities from negative neutral all the way up to positive Conduct these at regular set intervals. They need to be rapid, non-invasive, simple, so no specialist equipment or skills needed. Um, and you want to be able to track changes over time and focus again, again in on that continuous improvement philosophy. And that can allow prioritization for the zoo. So just a really quick background on the five domains model. Um, I'm hoping a lot of you guys have heard of this at least, but it is um, it is building on the, um, the five freedoms model that has been used quite commonly in animal welfare spaces for a long time. The five domains is, um, is a concept developed by Professor David Meller, who's at New Zealand, um, at Massey University in New Zealand, although he's retired now. And he's continuously, you know, he's, he's a true believer in this continuous improvement philosophy. And he is currently updating the model and he's, he does regular updates and writing about it at the moment. He's updating it at the moment and he's going to um, publish a new paper on it very shortly. So he'll, he'll get angry at me if I spill the beans on what the update is. So I won't, I won't share that today, but it, it's very relevant for zoos. So um, the, mo the model basically describes that there are four physical or functional domains of animal welfare, and these are nutrition, environment, physical health and behaviour that then lead to a mental domain, which is also called effective state. So if your physical or functional domains are all working well and, and in good states, then this should lead to a, more, a positive mental experience for the animal. And then ultimately, this is what your welfare status is, a combination of these physical or functional domains leading to your overall mental state, which then gives you an output of your welfare status. And again, recognizing that this is on a scale of negative all the way up to positive. So it's no good for us to just focus on what, you know, what prevents negative conditions. We want to focus on what prevents negative conditions, but also what goes beyond that and gives you positive experiences. So that's a key part of the development of the five domains model. 
So we use the five domains model or a, a tweaked version of the five domains model to develop our assessment till a few years ago. And I worked with Professor David Meller on this and we published the methodology. And I think this was sent around in, um, in some of the pre-reading for this webinar. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail around the methodology and the tool and the background to welfare assessment because it is described in that paper. So have a, have a look at that and then follow up with, um, and email me any questions if you have have, but I'll give a really high level summary of it. It is, so it is designed as a risk assessment tool and it's, it, it's designed to systematically collect information from a team of experienced zoo personnel. So we gather groups each year of zookeepers relevant to each animal that we're assessing, each group of animals we're assessing. We gather zookeepers, veterinarians, the managers of the team and also welfare researcher or specialist. And this welfare researcher is the chair and a consistent person across every single survey that we conduct for the organization. We've designed it to be applicable to all species. So from fish all the way up to um, elephants and it uses natural behavioral biology as a starting point or as a reference point for what we're assessing, but it allows provision for individual differences as well through in that recognizing that um, you know, species behavioral biology is one thing, but we also need to be really considerate of, you know, what life stage that individual's at, if there's any medical issues or, um, or any challenges associated with that individual's personal experience as well. We assess enclosure and the enclosure level across the entire zoo or three zoos for, for us here at Zoos Victoria. And so for group housed animals that are living in one enclosure for a whole group, we use the reference point as what we're, what's considered the most vulnerable animal. And this is because we wanted to take a conservative focus to, to welfare prioritization. So if you've got a group of meerkats and you're trying to assess them as a collective, if there's one individual that we think has um, particular welfare challenges, we'll assess the whole group according to that individual as we go through. We conduct the survey once a year and on average 15 to 20 minutes per enclosure. So if you're doing the maths, it is a, a lot of work for this one welfare researcher that is the consistent chair across the board. But for the groups of keepers and vets, it, it's, um, it's quite a rapid process for them to get involved in. And we score a total of 20 indicators or risk factors. And these are categorized across an adapted version of the physical or functional domains um, in the five domains model. And so these areas are environment, behavior, health and nutrition, and husbandry. So I'm not, I'm not gonna go into detail through all of the indicators, but here's a quick summary of what they look like. So here are our main risk factors or indicators in the environment domain. Um, all of those are what we call input or resource-based measures. Here's some health and nutrition indicators, behavior and behavioral opportunity indicators that we score. And a lot of those require, you know, the keeper knowledge on what they deliver for the animals in terms of what their enrichment program is like and how the animals use their enrichment. And then husbandry considerations. And this is what, this is the additional, or what we call the tweaked version of the five domains model. For zoos, we thought it was very relevant for us to do an assessment of husbandry considerations for, uh, for the animals in our care because of that really intense um, nature of the keeper zoo animal relationship. So we blended healthy nutrition into one domain. So that's a summary. Again, they're described in the, in the publication around what we consider under each of those areas. But for each of those domains and risk factors within the domains, the group discussions occur and we land on a judgment as a group for each indicator by scoring it either as negative, so that's what we call the highest risk to poor welfare. Um, neutral, moderate risk, so not perfect, but not, um, not a significant risk. Or positive, no observable risk, and we think that it's actually a, a good positive experience for the animal. So uh, it's considered to be species appropriate and, um, and the animal has good behavioral opportunities. And then we also have an unknown category, and I'll talk a bit more about that later, but this is, this is something that we introduced um, after a few years of trialing it to highlight where areas we have knowledge gaps in. And we use an online web form that exports these surveys into Excel. We convert the score 
to a number, so zero, one, or two, and that allows us to do a lot of um, analyses on it. So what we do in terms of um, the outcome that we report on, we, we calculate an average overall risk score for every single enclosure across the three zoos. So there's, um, we did about 300 assessments um, per year or just over across three zoos. And this risk score then gets assigned to that enclosure for the year. And that means then we can, we can focus on prioritization. So we do this by, by setting a threshold and the first year we did it, we, we calculated the spread of the data and used the lowest fifth percentile. And we, we flagged that as the threshold. Anything falling below that number were categorised as highest risk and therefore we wanted to do the most urgent interventions on those, on those enclosures. And we decided to maintain that threshold year after year, even though the spread of the data changed because this then allowed us to set targets to, to focus on improvement. We also look at the data by average, uh, looking at an average score across the different indicators of risk factors. So regardless of enclosure, what areas across our zoos do we need to do more targeted uh, strategic welfare interventions on? And this has highlighted areas of focus for us previously. And so it could be things like, you know, the, the species appropriate diet scores poorly or space allowance po scores poorly or husbandry routines. But, I'll talk a little bit more about the work we've done in that space in the next part. And this is a quick summary of how the results look. So like I said, we do over 300 um, surveys of enclosures each year, and we do it at the same time of year each year, and it takes roughly 15 to 30 minutes per enclosure to get through them. And this is how we present a lot of the results um, back to the property directors. So we, we summarise anything scored as negative fits below, sits below that threshold. And then as a proportion of enclosures assessed is what we, we keep track of. And then we report on what the change is year to year. And we set targets around trying to shift them all up into that positive category and what proportion we want to focus on for the next 12 months. Then we report on the indicators, like I described before with the data analysis, that what areas we need to focus on across the whole organisation to make improvements on. And our poorest scoring indicators across Zoos Victoria are around climate change variability. So how, you know, the, the amount of variation or choice animals have in, um, in different climate areas around their enclosure. So shade, shelter, cooling, heating, those kind of conditions or in offering species appropriate variability. Choice and control is a big one. And again, I'll talk a bit more about that, but um, ensuring we've got adequate choice and control for the animals to express in their day and time for animal observation. So the keepers we recognize need to spend a good amount of time observing their animals and studying them and getting to know them because animal behavior really is you know, our best window into what's going on in, in the minds of animals. And so the more timekeepers can have to conduct systematic observations, the more we're going to learn about the animals and the better we'll be able to provide for their welfare. So they're areas we're working on as improvement areas at the moment. And so we use the results um, in three key ways. Number one is to prioritise resource allocation each year. And so this is because we set expectations or targets before results are reported. So we say anything hitting below this threshold, we need to allocate resources to, to improve its score and, um, and fix those welfare challenges. And that allows, you know, for limited resources where your best, your best allocation or use of them is. Number two is we use it to identify strategic focus areas because again, of focusing on this continuous improvement philosophy, we need to be constantly looking for where we can improve. And this, this work can have um, good benefit across the whole industry. So across all zoos, where the work we do can be applied everywhere, but it's, it's particularly focused on what we think we need to work on at Zoos Victoria. And so they're those risk factor areas. And then lastly, we also use this to create a culture across the organisation where animal welfare is what we call a whole of organisation priority. And so we do this by re reporting on these targets and results and incorporating these into staff key performance indicators for all staff each year, including the property directors. And so this means that we, we have strategic 
um, a str strategic way to ensure that welfare becomes part of the culture of the organisation. And this is a, a huge game changer in trying to really push for advanced standards, which, um, which makes it front of mind for everyone. So quick summary of where we're at. So the institutional assessment tool at that level is really um, some key considerations in developing these kind of tools is to acknowledge limitations and trade-offs in your approach. So that's what I was talking about with the pyramid of animal welfare assessments. So, um, you know, the individual animal intensive um, science-based assessments are much more um, objective and, um, and very detailed and can give you a lot more individual animal information. But that's not possible to do on every single animal that lives across your whole, all zoos. Um, and so to acknowledge that trade-off, we need to have a system or a process in place that then allows us to prioritise where we should be directing those really intense individual observations and, and sampling. And so this is why we acknowledge the limitations by calling our tool um, a risk assessment assessment tool because we're really assessing risks to welfare and using that to make sensible uh, approaches or plans on how we can in enhance animal welfare and we want to base it on on science and scientific thinking around how good sensible assessment tools are developed and that's through the five domains model so I can uh, another consideration is the selection of indicators and what, what you should review and score for, for these kind of assessments. And then we want to update them as we go and we learn more about what is important in delivering good animal welfare. And so to achieve these um, considerations, we want to make sure that we use both resource-based and animal-based combination of, of measures and also make it usable for a range of taxonomic groups across the board as well. And then we want to ensure the assessors, so the, the subject matter experts, which are the zookeepers, the vets, and, um, and people involved in the actual assessments are well versed in the process and have access to all the necessary information to make informed judgments. So it's no use really using, you know, a fish keeper to make assessments on elephants if they're not familiar with what the details of the husbandry routine are, for example. And so what we do to manage that is, um, inclusive, we do it as a group and with a range of people from different ex expertise, including vets and keepers and welfare researchers. We do annual workshops for staff and we ensure that consistent chair sits across all assessments. And we also have a series of accompanying guidelines and documents that help um, make those judgments. So this is a point where I'm just going to pause on where we're at with that tool um, development and thinking and then the next part I'll focus um, mostly on some of these um, ad additional benefits that we've noticed with its use. So any questions Hi. from where we're at? Um, Sally, so I just might hand it over to Vilek. I think um, we've got a really good question about um, scientific uh, indicators. So if you're happy to turn on your microphone now, I'll, um, Vilek, I'll give it to you. I uh, just turned on my microphone. Yes. Do you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, I had a question if you have an example for a science-based indicator, because I think that is really a difficult uh, difficulty to choose and what kind of science-based uh, information you use. Yeah, that is, that's a great question because, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, um, a lot of disagreement in the scientific literature around what the best indicators are to observe or, or make assessments on animal welfare. There's, there's what's called three conceptual frameworks around what is the most useful way to assess uh, animals welfare. That's um, natural living concept, the um, effective state methodology, and then also what's called biological functioning. And biological function is by far the most studied um, suite of indicators or science-based measures, and that's things like um, the physiological changes that happen within an animal when there's a stress response encountered. So longevity, um, infant mortality rates, um, immune immunocompromise and, and various indicators like that. And they're useful to a certain degree, but ultimately the indicators, 
that you choose need to be, um, again, a trade-off between how, in, how much detailed information you can collect for that individual animal, but it also needs to be rapid and repeatable across time. It depends on what level you're, you're focusing on your assessment. But there's a, there's a range of indicators. Our 20 science-based indicators are what we focus on, and I... I'm obviously biased, but I think they're 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 strong and well backed by evidence that they are important in animal welfare. So they're the ones we've landed on. But I always encourage different zoos to um, to have a look at what what is important for the animals relevant, you know, in in their collection as well. So it's worth doing a bit of a scan across what indicators are available and out there, and what you think is the most relevant to the animals in your care. But the 20 we landed on across the domains are what we consider the most relevant for our purposes. Yeah. And, and are there uh, in AZA, or is there, uh, are zoos uh, using the same indicators because then you have like the same um, scientifically based assessments right. put together and Great more data. Question. Yeah, I wish that would then allow us to have a really nice benchmarking process across all zoos in the region. But that's not the case. Ours, um, ours is benchmarking within within our zoos over time. But um, we're hoping that soon, you know, the more zoos that use a, a common methodology, the more data we'll have across, you know, even the same species across zoos. And we'll be able to see um, through, you know, big complicated statistical analyses what environmental conditions are producing better welfare outcomes for that species across a range of housing types. But unfortunately, that doesn't exist right now in our region at this level. There are a few bits of research happening at the moment in developing, you know, elephant-specific welfare assessment tools, which I think will soon start to be rolled out for our region region so we can look at you know, the, using the same tool for elephants across um, you know the five or six zoos here that house elephants um, and I think uh, Isabella Clegg's done one for do dolphins and I think Melissa said she's going to be delivering uh, one of these webinars potentially as well and so there are species specific tools you can use that would be really interesting to study across sites but this um, this tool is is one that we do focused on our zoos, but um, yeah, not across a range of zoos at this stage. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. We just have one other quick question um, from Vicky. Vicky, I'll just hand the microphone over to you now as well. Okay, nice to nice to hear you, Sally. And obviously, oh hi, Vicky. Hello, and obviously, this is a time that my daughter thinks that she wants to come and join us. Um, but I was, um, yeah, it was really, really clear. So thank you for that. Um, it's a, a a question picking up on, I guess, the conundrum between time and money and detail, and asking about what you think the longevity of the welfare audit scores are. So that's sort of part one, I guess. So do you think they're truly representative for the whole year? Could it be more? Could it be less? Um, and are there ways you think that we could collect an evidence base to have a look at what the longevity of those scores might be? Yes, great question. We debate this internally a lot. I Obviously, the I think the more frequent your assessment, the more relevant the information is throughout the year because it's especially of um, seasonal changes in what's um, what is influencing animal welfare at different times of the year when we do our assessments we try and account for that as best we can by asking you know the the judgments to be based on the collective year but you know front of mind is what and we do it we do our assessments in july and august which is winter for us and so we do unsurprisingly have a lot of risks raised around lack of heating uh, opportunities and things like that which might not be as front of mind for example if we did it in summer so there are a lot of trade-offs that 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 we try and account for as best we can but by keeping it at the same time of year each year that's another way we try and manage that um, that variability but i'd say the more frequent you can do it 
the better and the more I think relevant um, it will be at each time, point of time for animals. But um, it is that trade-off around, um, it's a really intensive process for the, the chair. Um, that's the one that it, it it's, takes us about a month to do the 300 assessments moving across the three different zoos. So that's a, a solid month's work for our welfare researcher at that um, at that point in time. And so, you know, if we did it every six months, that would be ideal from a data point of view, but um, from a practicality point of view, not not so um, so usable. But the other consideration is we do it in line with um, what we call our property operations planning. And so we want to allocate our budgets and resources to those priority um, and, and a lot of them are, you know, enclosure renovations and things that do have quite a long lead time and are quite expensive. And so it fits in with that process. If we were focusing on um, a bit more of the, the changes that fluctuate more frequently, behavioural things, then um, we might be better off doing it at a higher frequency. But as you say, it's that, it's that trade off. But yeah, it, evidence, what was the second part of your question? Developing an evidence base to inform the longevity, um, would love to do some kind of um, methodology-based study to look at what is the best frequency to get the most accurate information uh, for yeah for the animals and and the welfare that that changes even month to month versus six months versus twelve months versus two years and and see where we land. But it's a bit of a blend for us between scientific processes and direct application for property um, zoo-based changes. So we think we've found a nice, a nice middleman there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I do, I do also wonder that in trying to study the longevity, it could be one of those things that's really intensive in a couple of, like over a couple of years perhaps, but in actual fact, you might find that you're already at the ideal but you then have had two years of pretty intensive data collection to say, well, you know what, seasonal change doesn't quite make the differences we expected and or husbandry stays the same all year and that's one part that we're assessing. So it, it, yeah, I, I think certainly, I th I'm sure there's a lot of us that would be happy to support because I suspect it might not be that you're far off at all, but it would then also maybe if it did need to be slightly more frequently that you then, as you said at the beginning, the minute you have the evidence base, right, you, you have the opportunity to really lobby to, 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 to make the change. But, um, but mm. no, something is better than nothing. And I'm sure annually is more regularly than some are done elsewhere. So, mm. yeah. Nice PhD opportunity, I think. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, I think we'll save the rest of the questions to the end discussion time and we'll just launch straight back into the next bit of your presentation, Sally. Sure, and I will fly through this. I'm sorry, I have been um, banging on a bit. No, um, great, all right. So what we're calling useful spin-offs. Um, and so these are three areas I wanted to um, highlight from this. So the use of the tool is, um, I've just described as, as it's used for prioritization of resource allocation in, in focusing on continuous improvement in welfare. This is all focused on the, these little spin-offs or offshoot organizational um, positive benefits that we see. So, and very, very briefly on a lot of these as well, I'll spend the most amount of time on the last one, the research planning and, and focus area in the strategic welfare advancement. And that is probably because that is the area I'm most passionate and interested in. But anyway, these other parts are interesting and important as well. So we've also noticed, uh, in addition to what the tool is designed for, um, huge advancements and benefits in what, what we're calling staff development or training opportunities in advancing language and thinking around animal welfare across um, particularly our zookeeper staff. And that's because it's an annual process. And we begin each time of year with a short workshop and we focus in on a different area each year. Um, 
and given an, an update through our welfare science team in what the latest advancements are. Like I said, that you know that exponential increase in in research. We update our staff on what a lot of those updates are and what we now know that we didn't even know 12 months earlier, and that I think cements in the the rate of change and the importance of being adaptable, but it also allows us to have that opportunity to have open discussions around animal welfare and create this positive culture around, um, around what we're trying to do to enhance welfare. And also as part of this, um, the, the training opportunities, the group discussions being chaired by our, our welfare expert who is um, a PhD in animal welfare, is what we call on the job training by coaching them through some of the you know critical analysis around what we should be looking for in certain risk factors or indicator areas we also then following data collection um, rather than have it sit with um, with our science team we want to transfer it over to the um, I, sorry, I've been talking a lot like the, the science team and then the properties that's because our organization structure has a science team and then the, the zoo, the three zoo properties. So the science team work very closely with zookeepers and managers, for example, but um, the science team run the data collection with input from the properties, do the data analysis and report writing, and then hand that over to the, the property teams and the zookeepers. And then those guys actually then come up with the countermeasures or the welfare interventions, develop the plans, and then do the monitoring and follow-up of, of reassessment on how they've gone in addressing the risks identified. And obviously they, they, they have that mentoring by the welfare specialists and the science team throughout the year. And we also offer some staff fellowships for certain gaps that we may have found um, where we, the science team fund, um, it's almost like a, a short-term scholarship opportunity, um, a, a staff member to be, taken off their keeping jobs, say for you know four to six weeks to conduct the research or, or develop information and then at work on that full time and then use that to then um, be integrated into the husbandry and the, and the welfare risk plan. And so all this is done in, on a 12 month cycle. And we found as a result of that, it's encouraged a lot of great, um, uh, yeah, a lot of great discussions and um, and thinking uh, an advancement of knowledge and um, and language use across animal welfare in the three zoos. We've also adapted the tool to help us with other decision making and planning processes across the zoos. So one example um, that we've used it for is to help inform new exhibit designs or renovations of certain areas. This is because we found we wanted to have a bit of a blueprint for, you know, that we could pick up and use for each species in, in what kind of habitats we wanted to create that's based on their behavioral biology. And so we adapted the tool to create a design guide, a checklist, and then plan the behavioral opportunity throughout the space. And here's an example of what it looks like and each of those little codes are um, a code for a different behavior that we wanted to encourage in different areas throughout that space. And here's a short video of what it looks like in action. Uh, these are Leadbeater's possums, critically endangered species that we work with here in Victoria. This is, um, these guys are a recovery species. So these ones aren't on display to the public, but, um, but being bred for hopeful release to the wild one day when habitats, um, in a better state and we wanted to build up specific types of fitness in these guys so each of these um, these features in this what we call the Leadbeater's Possum Jungle Gym is designed specifically for it to target a certain muscle group and this was designed based off this adapted version of the tool so here's a little video showing the possums in action And we assess their health and, and condition pre-access uh, pr to this enclosure program, just like we do our own health and fitness body condition programs to make sure that we, you know, we, we hit the right target areas.
and this is a rotational space that they, they move through and different pairs have access to. So that's just a, a nice little summary of that in action. The other adapted version of the tool that we use is to inform decision making around moving animals. So I'm not sure if you guys are similar in Iyaza, but we tend to, um, to want to move animals around a bit according to different age requirements or you know, group changes and various other bits and pieces. But we set a standard that we only want to move animals to an enclosure that provides greater welfare outcomes. We don't want to be going backwards. And so then to inform how we do this, we used an adapted version of our assessment tool where we look at focusing on the environment domain and do an assessment of the current enclosure, then what the new enclosure or proposed, um, proposed new enclosure would be, and then do an assessment of the net change. And this has, um, this has been a, a great tool that we use to inform animal moves and species planning and zoo design um, around um, year round. So this is the last of the, um, what we're calling positive spin-offs that I wanted to spend a bit of time on. And this is again, linking it back to what I was saying at the start, how important science um, and a strong evidence base is to decision-making and how interrelated good science is in different areas to having a well-informed tool or process to, to conduct these assessments. And so we've ended up using just in the last three years, um, this tool to actually inform our research priorities for the year as well. And that's through the analysis of the unknown. So when I was describing the tool methodology, I said we score them as negative, neutral, or positive, or unknown if we feel we just don't have the, enough information to make an informed judgment. And so then when we look at the analysis of the frequency of unknowns across the different indicators or species types, this can highlight where our big knowledge gaps are. And so this then informs our research program for the next 12 months as well. And so we, we then categorize our research efforts into two main buckets. One is what we call evidence-based management. So these are quite um, what we call reactive research investigations. So things into abnormal behavior, the impact of noise, lighting, visitor effects, for example, enclosure change or renovation evaluations um, or enrichment evaluations and time budget um, assessments across different species. Then we also have another bucket of science that we do, which is the advancement of knowledge and practice. And so this is the more um, strategic areas that we focus on. Um, areas like the development of new monitoring tools, keeper animal relationships, cognitive enrichment and choice and control. So these big kind of hard hitting research questions that we, we want to advance the knowledge in for our benefit, but also that could have benefits to the zoo industry more broadly. And to just give you a rough idea, we have on average, usually um, between 20 and 30 research projects um, in these areas around health and welfare each year. So some examples of these focus areas that we've been working on, we identified reptile welfare as a big gap and huge um, lack of knowledge and understanding in reptile welfare. So um, we, we did a little bit of research, desktop research and developed some guidelines that we're now rolling out and testing if we've um, done the guidelines adequately at the, at the moment. Um, and so that reptile welfare assessment has been a, a, a big area of research for us recently and is, is a continuing one. Uh, animal training for healthcare, proactive healthcare is another one. And we have some very interesting species that we work with that aren't particularly motivated to, um, to engage in some of these training sessions. So the keepers are spending a lot of time working at how they can get regular weights on animals like this koala here. And then our ability to non-invasively monitor animals. So without having, having to have someone stand there all day and, and watch animals directly, um, we, we did a big investment in, um, in cameras that could give us insight into the behavior of the animals without observers influencing them. And here's a short video of a helmeted honey eater, again, a, a critically endangered species of um, Victorian bird here that um, is engaging in a very strange incubation behavior that we hadn't seen before, but I suspect it was a, um, 
a little one-off trial. Sorry, nest feeding it is. Thought it would try try rolling on its back for a little while, but you know, fascinating things and insights into animal behaviour that we've seen from this investment in, in these kind of um, systems has been incredible. Choice and control has been another big area um, of focus for us. We, um, we wanted to reduce a lot of the enrichment programs to give animals more choice or control over when and how they have access to the enrichment and emus are playing in water. So this is an example of the activated mister that we installed the emus rather than having to wait for the people to use hoses and sprinklers. And then the big one that we've been working on um, a lot recently, and one that I know um, Iaz is also interested in, and, and Vicky, who Vicky Melfi, who I'm sure you all know, um, is a, a world-renowned expert in this space, is visitor-animal interactions, and and stressing again how how important this is for zoos to be on top of as we move forward. And so this is um, you know, a, a topic that's been in the news a lot. There's been a strong campaign from World Animal Protection that actually targeted WAZA um, for their, their standards or lack of standards around um, animal visitor interactions. And they actually now have um, a set of standards that they've recently launched that, um, that to try and advance progress in this area across the membership. And it has, um, yeah, I think recently hit news again with uh, the Tiger King Netflix documentary and, um, and raised debate again in this space. So it's going to be a topic that zoos really need to get on top of and get strong positions on. Um, so the process we went through to try and tackle some of this has been um, about 18 months in the making so far, a bit, a bit longer for some of the welfare side of it. But the first step we wanted to go through is what does the science tells us, tell us around animal welfare associated with, um, sorry, welfare associated with uh, in animals in these events. So we did a literature review to look at what impacts there were or evidence for impacts or opportunities if there's positive experiences that animals um, have. And main point is very little that's been studied. Here's a quick summary of um, some of the, the research projects that have been done in this area. I know that's a lot of information to take in and um, don't worry about any of the detail. It's just there to say that's actually um, pretty much the extent of the research that's been done um, in this space in animal welfare associated with these experiences that highlights it's, it is a bit of a, a gap in our knowledge. But then what we realised pretty quickly is this discussion is not just about the welfare implications of these experiences. It's also got a whole other side to it, which is about the image or the community perception of what we do. And so we then conducted a literature review, review on the social science associated with these kind of experiences and what visitors' um, perceptions and attitudes were. And I love this quote um, by Hampton in 2019 that um, denial of the importance of public opinions is the most likely outlook to doom industries to the dustbin of social license history. And this is so relevant for zoos to understand. And so I think the best example I use that's relevant here in the um, Australian context is the debate around um, eggs for, for human consumption. So the welfare researchers and the, and the scientists tell us that the best welfare outcomes for hens are those housed in what's called an enriched cage system. So they have access to um, enrichment, to good social contact and um, various behavioural opportunities they need. However, it's still in a cage system. So they're, they're protected from some of the threats associated with outdoor life. Um, but the general public still just won't buy any any eggs associated with the, the term cage or any any kind of housing of an animal in an enriched cage and um, the, the consumer preference is around a free range farm that has actually um, pretty, some pretty significant welfare implications for the hens housed in those systems in terms of um, disease risk and 
um, smothering risk, predation risk and various other um, challenges there. But it just highlights that it's not just about the welfare science that we need to really consider. That's a really strong foundation and starting point and critical to informing us. But we also really need to understand what's going on inside the, the human brain in a public facing um, organisation. So after we did these reviews on the welfare science and the social science, we then um, developed some draft guidelines that were reflective of this science and came up with a model um, for what, how we want to run these kind of experiences. And we all agreed that we, wanna, we want people to be in awe of animals for what and who they are, not what use they are for us. So to encourage connection between people and animals, um, we want to do it in a way that fosters respect for their wildness and intrinsic value of individuals and species. So we landed on a model that's called an ecocentric model that really puts the animal as, as the focus, not about the photo of me with an animal, for example. It's all about the animal. And so then we have a set of detailed do's and don'ts guidelines for how we should run these experiences. And at the moment, we are in the process of... Um, actually, now these are draft guidelines. We're testing them to, by conducting an, an audit of what we currently do and then coming up with a way we can reimagine. And then we've got um, research happening as well alongside this testing um, human attitudes and, um, and experience associated with the different ways in which we run these experiences. And, and um, this is all very... Um, very fresh and, and still being rolled out as we speak, but a huge area of interest for us and we think for the broader zoo community in this topic. And one that has happened as a result of it being flagged in our animal welfare survey process over um, multiple years in a row as being one that we needed to pay a lot of attention to. So um, just a, yeah, a huge piece of strategic work like this can um, come off the back of a welfare assessment tool that you know was never designed to really lead to this but when you use it strategically it can have um, positive spin-off benefits like this so that is it from me i'm sorry everyone i feel like i've gone well over time here but hopefully that gives you a bit of insight into first of all the tool um, and the process we uh, went through for that but then also some of the um i would say the yeah, the, the strategic positive outcomes that we've experienced as a result of implementing such a process. So I've got plenty of time for questions um, if you guys do, but I realise I've probably gone over time. So um, I think we've still to, have a question. to Melissa. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and if we do, if everyone, if some people need to go as well, um, we will be uploading the recording to Facebook after. So if you do have other obligations, we will carry on with the discussion for a little bit because we've got some really interesting questions that have popped up throughout um, the presentation. So I might hand over first to Isabella. Um, Isabella, do you want to ask your question directly? Question directly. Yeah, sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Sally. It was really, really interesting. Um, I kind of, uh, this question's from the beginning, but I think it's a kind of running theme throughout your um, presentation, but I was wondering what you think about the welfare evidence-based and where it's not sometimes accepted by animal rights organizations or NGOs. I mean, I've, I think thinking of your pyramid with the individual welfare assessments, where as you say, we do loads of research and it's really objective. I think I've personally had even that research just been thrown back in my face and told that it's not it's not um, accurate because I, it was funded by zoos. I know this is an impossible question to um, answer, but I don't know if you have any insight on how you guys work maybe with NGOs or do we need to publish somewhere differently or well, I don't know what you think. Yeah, great, yeah. great question. It is, it is such a balance um, because I think everyone just needs to be completely aware of all of the conflict of interest associated with this work. But um, that, I mean, there's no one in this industry working with or for animals that doesn't have some form of conflict of interest or agenda, you know, behind what they're yeah. doing. And we acknowledge that and get that on the table and then just agree. The way we work um, here with our 
um, our colleagues who are more in the animal rights space, um, if we consider our animal welfare space and some of the activist groups in the rights space, we, we, we set out and agree on um, shared goals. And there are a lot of shared goals between our organisations. We're all working for animals and we want what's best for animals. We might just have some differences in opinion around um, what that means or how, what the best way to achieve that is. But we, you know, we often set that aside and focus on the, on the shared goals. And that has created a really productive working relationship with, um, with a lot of organisations that you wouldn't typically associate um, to work in partnership with zoos. But we do find science and research is, um, is a strong common um, goal or tool that we want to use um, to answer a lot of these questions. I think, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time acknowledging the, the gaps in our understanding. And I think it comes back to that point I made earlier about being able to be brave in the animal welfare space and acknowledge we don't have the answers and we need some science to inform those answers and then be ready to hear those results if we if it's what they want if if it's what we want to hear or we don't want to hear it doesn't matter but we need to hear it and act on them accordingly i think the biggest point of conflict arises when um there's almost a head in the sand um response where you don't um you you have some of the, the science and you don't respond accordingly that's not a good position for anyone to be in so you need to be prepared to act once you have all the information but yeah it is i mean it is a fine a fine line and a fine balance we've um we've established good working relationships but i know that's not the case everywhere and it really depends on um yeah uh, uh, motivations behind a lot of organizations in this space but um yeah sorry that's probably not overly yeah no no exactly i mean do you guys go as far as publishing the results of your welfare assessments yeah yeah we did and um and we yeah there was a lot of internal discussion around that at at this stage and we report um so we, we did scientific publications but we also annually report in our annual report animal incidences and investigations that we do as well in um trying to be transparent and completely upfront and honest about what we're working on and there's a yeah there's a really strong animal welfare research group active here in Australia that actually are bringing together the scientists and so the university based scientists and the industry groups to focus on this issue of transparency in animal welfare and really have it as an open discussion point but it is um yeah it it requires bravery but also um i think that bravery is what is a strength of the zoo sector and we just need to use it in the in the right most productive way that has the best outcomes for the animals and and visitors agreed thank you okay so moving on to another question we have one from samantha sam would you like to pose your question to sally now hi sally thanks for a brilliant talk um sorry it's not hey, in person <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm a, a really big advocate of involving keepers in zoo research. Um, so this is not meant to be against that uh, idea that of getting them involved. But I'm just wondering if you think that it's possible that the keepers, uh, when they're doing the welfare assessments of their various different animals, um, might uh, be a little bit biased or might miss minor uh, aspects because they're seeing it every day. So I suppose my question is, how do you ensure objectivity throughout your welfare assessments? Yes. There, there definitely is um, an element of that that comes in into play, and that I think uh, we we accept that that we're never going to completely stamp out the the objectivity. But what we we do have is a, a few checks and balances in place that we've adapted and added year after year to try and minimise that level of objectivity and that. You know, the, I think the main game changer for us was um, we used to do it as individual surveys that um, keepers would go off and fill out individually and then we'd look at averages across. But what we changed then to was a group um, discussion with that um, consistent chair coordinating the discussion. And that um, we think that has had a good 
um, a, a much more a, kind of weeds out some of the um, the other factors that might come into the um, some motivation behind what you know why we'd want to score a certain indicator this this or this because the stakes are pretty high because keepers keepers do want to do what's best for the animals and so if it's about resource prioritization and allocation there is a tendency to score I think more harshly to try and get changes made more urgently and so it does rely heavily <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and good on them they're being very strategic but it, it you the chair does need to um be completely aware of that and experience in um try to focus the discussion and get to the root cause of what um we're really assessing as part of uh, as part of it so i'd say the chair's a big one the, uh, the group discussions the chair coordinating that then the the nature of the indicators as well being ones that um, we need a lot of clarity on to discuss. So limiting the amount of objectivity that come into each risk factor that we're scoring. And also we introduced this last round of surveys last year, um, some scoring guidelines that um, tried to focus on consistency so you know what would be considered after having years of um, experience in what typical issues or um, positive outcomes came up in each indicator we then were able to give examples for consistencies to help um, guide the assessments and what would be a positive neutral or negative so um, that was a recent addition that we think really um, really smoothed out the consistency and the approach there so it's, it's, we acknowledge that that's a, a limitation to the process, but have um, tried to minimise it as much as possible. But um, we, it, it, it's just, it's all in the interpretation and how we use the, the results as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, that was really good. Um, I do have another question from Rebecca, but I will be asking that one on Rebecca's behalf. So, uh, basically, when you're creating the priority list um, for with these welfare assessments, do you have you ever found that certain perhaps less charismatic species um, do not seem to get prioritised for these improvements? Um, it's something that Rebecca has noticed with uh, probably less publicly um, liked species or charismatic species, despite behavioural effects, um, they are being that are being overlooked for management and resource prioritisation. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, another brilliant question. This is a this is a smart bunch. <laughs> um, yes, is the answer. We have uh, we did especially early days in the process notice that we find it's a combination of our I think knowledge and ability to make informed judgments on mammal welfare, for example, because we're a lot more familiar with the um, the indicators or, or um, observable indicators of um, what looks to be good or poor welfare with those guys whereas reptiles and fish for example um, it, yeah it's it's a lot a lot more challenging to have really overt or observable changes and so even in the the teams that work with them and so there is there is a big taxonomic um, difference particularly early on but that was one of the things we really wanted to target through some strategic interventions. And that's why we developed those, um, that focus area of the reptile welfare guidelines and did a, a lot of work in that space and, and education on that space and, and research into that. And so that helped with raising the profile of how important welfare of you know, that group of animals is. And our next target is, um, is fish. And so we've, but a master's student starting on um, looking into welfare assessment processes in fish really soon. So that's going to be an exciting strategic. We don't have a lot of fish um, in our animals, but we do have um, some big kind of habitat spaces for them. So that's going to be a big area of focus for us and trying to raise the profile of, of these animals because um, it's equally important for us to deliver on um, fish welfare projects as it is for elephant welfare. And we even did just to, it was a bit of a strategic 
piece as well to raise the profile. We did a welfare research experiment on our butterfly house and butterflies in the butterfly house last year. Um, I mean, I use the term welfare loosely then. We were really looking at um, survival and, and um, we know that that's not you know, a great metric for, for welfare, but we decided to focus on that and use that as a, a bit of a showcase or a poster child for, um, we, we take welfare seriously from all individuals living at the zoo. So um, yeah, really, really important to have assessments across the board. Don't just focus on mammals, for example, and then do a few strategic organizational projects that raise the profile and the importance and have a bit of fun with it as well for, for those, those species that need a bit more attention. Perfect, that's, um, that's really good. Um, so I do have a couple of questions coming through now, but we are um, running late on time. So I will just um, allow one last final question from Vicky, but those that haven't been able to ask their questions, we will be posting a recording on Facebook. We will be monitoring the comments section. If you want to email directly to me and I can pass the questions on to Sally, that's absolutely fine as well. So this is an open discussion that we want to keep going for some time because it's so relevant, obviously, in our community, um, our zoo community at the moment. Um, but a very topical question coming in from Vicky. So I'll hand over to Vicky at the moment. Hi, Sally. So this is now getting to another part of your um, presentation. Um, where you were talking about human animal interactions and you were talking about how zoos are perceived and I think you know this is obviously very topical um, but equally it's very interesting given the video that you started with and how um, the messaging was I guess maybe distancing yourselves from the word zoo or maybe transforming the the view of what zoos are um, and certainly I think given that there's a large proportion of the public who probably don't differentiate between the Tiger King and good zoos, do you think the zoos yeah, or, or the word zoo is something that we need to distance ourselves from or, or how, how do we change that, that opinion so that the public are able to differentiate? Mm. God, Vicky, really, um, Sorry. Don't, yeah, straight for the big, <laughs> the big <laughs> question there. It, um, this is actually really interesting. We did, we did survey our staff on this to, to try and understand because we've had this discussion at, you know, the senior executive level and it's, it's split down the middle. There's half of us that are, um, We've, we've tried so hard, people associate, you know, the word zoo's tainted and will be forever tainted because of the history. Um, and then it, and because of, you know, the scale of good zoo to bad zoo and, and various other factors. And then, then there's half that go, no, we need to own ourselves as a zoo and change how, you know, what, how the community perceives what zoos do. And we don't have an answer yet in, in short, because it did just completely um, split the, split the crowd into what what we think i've got a i've got a personal opinion on it which is i i am very i would be very happy to move away from the term zoo but i that's that's a personal thought just because i yeah uh, but i'm not sure we've tried hard enough to really reframe um you know the length of history that zoos have been through it's all recent history, these rapid developments in new zoos in, in our work in conservation and animal welfare. And so it's, it's possible we haven't tried hard enough to, to shift that public opinion of what a zoo is. But um, I, yeah, and I think because I work closely with a lot of the organisations that um, aren't huge fans of, of zoos, it would make my job easier if we weren't called a zoo. So I might be taking the easy way out there. But um, it's even even I'm torn 50-50 in my mind, but it is it is a really important discussion. Um, I think, yeah, for, for us to have um, and just, yeah, I, I think all, all I can land on is the, the worst possible outcome would be if we tried to change our name from zoo, but didn't actually change what we are or the practices we do and that that in my mind is we shouldn't be changing the terminology around zoo unless we are completely 
um, revolutionised what we do and how we do it and made a clear point of difference. And so I don't think um, any of us are, are ready for that quite dramatic shift just yet, but it is um, a really important discussion for us for us as, a, as an, um, an industry, as a, as a sector to have these discussions. But what do you think, Vicky? Nice. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's, yeah, I, I think actually that we probably, and this is, this is me saying we, which is a bit bold now that I'm sort of in the, in the academic sector sort of, but I, I think that in actual fact, there have been many more steps forward than are probably even recognized by our own profession. And thinking about it recently, it occurs to me that zoos now still call themselves modern zoos, but that's a moniker which has been used for decades. So in actual fact, mm -hmm. even the idea of a modern zoo was created so many decades ago that to call yourself a modern zoo isn't contemporary. It doesn't have any currency right now. And so, to actually call yourself a modern zoo is looking backwards to when that was pioneering. And so absolutely, I think there's probably a lot of scope for renaming uh, sort of good parts uh, of the profession and feeling justified that there have been huge leaps since you know frankly even the 60s but even at the turn of the century they were talking about a modern zoo and you go crikey like a century ago and we're still mm. going oh yeah no look we, we have this vision and then by the 60s it's a conservation center but that was in the 60s and so what we are doing now and what is being done now is such a sea change but yet the terminology of a modern zoo because modern sounds like it's contemporary but it's not it's actually mm. in the past so I do mm -hmm. think that there, there is scope. And I think mm -hmm. one of the great silver linings of COVID has been, it didn't feel like a silver lining, no doubt, for everybody who was running around like a headless chicken, creating the change, but the engagement and the ability to connect so far beyond the perimeter is something that's been inspiring. And I think potentially does set the scene for being able to demonstrate that, oh God, I didn't realize because I haven't visited one in X amount of time or because I have these ethical reasons why I wouldn't. Well, you can't fail to see over Twitter and, and other social media channels, zoos are everywhere and the work they're mm. doing is everywhere and it might not be what you thought it was going to be. So I think it's a ripe time. And so it would be nice it's always tricky when it's also industry as well as profession. It would be nice if there was a common consensus of what, what that new looks like, because I think there is a new. I think what you're talking about is probably even newer than that in terms of going into becoming ethical organisations. I think there are a number which are already um, and or are working towards it. But yeah, I, I think there's a great need. I don't know whether it means that there's a new precursor to Zoo so mm. than a modern zoo, I don't know what, what type of zoo we're talking about, um, mm. or indeed whether they're just wildlife and conservation NGOs, welfare and, and conservation NGOs, just like other NGOs. Um, mm. but, but certainly to stand shoulder to shoulder with other organisations that are fighting for good welfare and fighting for good conservation, I think absolutely. Yeah. Um, and on that, Vicky, we noticed... Um, yeah, the most incredible alliances in the recent bushfires for us here, um, here in Victoria in, in the different animal organisations, yes, yeah, standing shoulder to shoulder in this, but also it became very obvious to us that, um, that we've got so much work to do with our community because a lot of them were going, oh, um, didn't realise zoos would be the ones in there, you know, responding to wildlife in trouble or running the threatened species recovery programs, you know, hand in hand with the government. And, and so, yeah, that completely reframed, yeah, some of the, some of the work we do in, in the community's eye, but yeah, one, it's, it's always, you know, we know, we live and breathe what we are now and what we do, but I think we've, we haven't, we haven't, taken the community along that journey well enough with us just yet. But um, I think, yeah, hopefully we'll get there sooner rather than later, but we'll see. Yeah. And definitely with your evidence and, and presentations like that, for sure. Yeah, that, it, it's been a brilliant discussion, guys. And April has just made a really good comment as well, is that the trouble with 
unaccredited or roadside zoos can also call themselves whatever the new term is um, because it's so difficult yeah. globally. Um, so a very good point by April there, but um, we could have this discussion for the next hour. It's such an um, interesting one. But um, I think we might have to leave it there for the webinar today, guys. It has been absolutely fantastic, Sally. The information that you've given us today has been brilliant. And thank you so much for your time and sharing it with the wider zoo community. It's just been absolutely amazing. And thank you so much for everyone that's joined us today. We had a really good turnout from the registration numbers. And I really do appreciate that you've committed the time at, um, at the moment to join us today and to be involved in the discussion and learning. So thank you so much for everyone. There will be more webinars to come. We will let you know about them. So uh, we will be uploading the recording later today. Uh, feel free to continue the discussion in the comments and things like that. And uh, we'll, we'll be in touch, more webinars to come. And if you've got any suggestions about topics that you really want um, to see covered, please do send them through as well. Um, but yes, have a lovely- And thank you all. Thank you all for tuning in and, um, and listening to what's happening over in this part of the world. Very much appreciated. And um, yeah, reach out if anyone has any further questions.